FTNS, where fitness comes to life. The Body Shop connects you with the hottest fitness models in the world. Learn the backstage secrets that most successful bikini divas, fitness models, and bodybuilders use to dominate their competition and land on the covers of magazines. Only here at The Body Shop will we allow you to listen and talk to the best of the best in fitness competition. If you're passionate about bodybuilding and fitness, you have found your new home. All of us here at FTNS Radio would like to welcome you to The Body Shop. Body Shop. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome your host, Andre Brick St. Clair. Ah, yes, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of The Body Shop. Thank you for allowing The Body Shop into your homes and into your airwaves. Only here at The Body Shop will you learn the backstage secrets that the most successful bikini divas, models, and bodybuilders use to dominate their competition. With me in the studio is my co-host, the owner of FitnessAtlantic.com, Mr. Brian Canone. How's it going, Andre? I can't call it today, B, man. You know, I'm just having a good time. How about you? Not bad, not bad. Not bad, huh? No. Okay, okay. Well, see, in just a few short weeks, mm -hmm. right, we have the WBFF World Championships taking place August 27th, 2011 mm -hmm. at the Living Arts Center. That's 4141 Living Arts Drive in Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. I'm going to be there. We're going. I know you're going to be there. Yeah. I know a few of my friends are coming out there. Uh, I got a call from a guy named Daryl Holloman, yep. who's going to be on the show tomorrow. Okay. Okay. He told me he's going to be there. He's going to be on stage. He wants to call out a few people. You know, he's, uh, he's looking for that friendly competition. You know, he's looking to bring some excitement back into it. And one of the people that he mentioned that he actually wants to be on stage with and next to and actually beat is Rob Rich. Rob Riches. Rob Riches, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rob Riches. Well, you know, I, I get this film. We didn't go the year that, we, you know, I was there last year for the show. Mm -hmm. And um, I think for some type of uh, business reason, you know, Rob Riches wasn't able to come. But uh, <coughs> he, he's done a lot of shows. Um, he's pretty popular on the Internet. Um, from what I hear, his YouTube page is just off the hook. You know, it gets like 10,000 views for a, a workout clip that he puts up, you know. And he, he does them very often. Okay. Uh, it's like... Um, you know, if I'm able to talk to him, that, that's really what I want to find out. You know, how he blows up his YouTube page so good. You know, how he's so popular on right. YouTube and, and, and how that works for him. But he's been around, you know, and um, he's from the, the UK. Okay. And um, you can see here, like, he, he's done work with uh, Bodybuilding.com. He has a, a supplement endorsement contract. Right. Um, we'll find out a little bit about that. Um, I think he's out in L.A. Mm-hmm. And, um... I think right now, yeah, he's on the line. That's right. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the body shop, Mr. Rob Riches. Big Rob. Yo, I love that. That sounds like when I was last on stage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. How you doing out there, man? Doing really good, thanks. Yeah, I'm actually in a... Just about to leave Las Vegas. I came out for a friend's wedding. Okay. And uh, it's one thing having to diet and be disciplined and focused for a big competition like the WBFF Worlds. But to be doing that in Las Vegas, surrounded by friends and family for a close friend's wedding, it's, uh, it puts everything to the test. But I'm glad I've seen it through. I've remained on track and now back to LA to finish off these final final six weeks. That's right, that's right, that's right. And now the WBFF Worlds will be taking place August 27th, okay? Yes. And that's gonna be in Toronto, Canada. So let me ask you this first question right off the bat, all right? Okay. Is there any athlete that you would like to see on stage so you can either compete next to them or beat them? <laughs> <laughs> Haven't you been following the Twitter feeds? I've been trying to. I've been trying to, man. But you know what We're I mean. Hearing you know. a little bit about him. You know what? Um, 
I'll be completely honest here. I, at this stage, I can't overlook anyone. Okay. My game plan is to obviously come back better than the winner in 2009, which was myself. Because <laughs> if, I if I don't come back better, I, I wouldn't even want to step on stage because how can I expect to, how can I expect to up the ante if I'm not even up in the ante in my own game? So, first of all, obviously I want to beat myself and, and better my condition, but I'm aware that every other athlete on that stage had me to be in 2010. Unfortunately, I wasn't there because of my cousin's wedding and a few other things, which we can get onto later. And, you know, now Obi is the standard to beat. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, we, we've been, there's been bound to going back and forth, but when it comes down to it, I do have respect and admiration for these guys on stage. We have our fun kind of going back and forth, but realistically, we all give it our all. And it, it, I think it's going to come down to who performs better on the day. I mean, we've got everything to gain, but everything to lose as well, especially someone like Obi and myself. And I hear Michael's coming back. So all of the, the past and previous champions are going to be on stage once again at the same time. So I've got to say, Obi is my main competitor based on winning last year okay. and coming close second to me in 2009. Mm -hmm. um, I hear that David is once again returning. And it's funny, I actually met David. David came on to uh, an, uh, an internet TV show that I was doing a couple of years back with um, Noel DeGanter, a great photographer who's now blowing up the fitness industry. Okay. And um, he was already doing a little bit here and there, uh, David was. and. I guess we kind of introduced him to somebody and, and they kind of got him out and literally within months this guy was popping up on magazine covers so, <laughs> um, he, he's definitely one to watch out for I know there's some uh, great talent again coming from Toronto and Canada yes um, you got Vince you got Amma you got um, Barack I, I hear again I've met these guys I was at Vince's party last year his birthday Mm -hmm. um, which again Vince if you're listening thanks again for inviting me I had a great time chatting with, with you and your friends and you really do know how to throw a party so everyone's talking I just hope that uh, they can follow through with their walk on stage oh I like that I like that you see we've had Vince on the show just last week Vince was up um, on the show and you know he had his father with him and he had a lot of positive things to say about you We've had Micah on the show. Micah speaks very highly of you. David Kimberly has done the body shop. You know, um, these are all great athletes that, you know, they just have a mutual respect for one another. Hearing you speak about each athlete and saying something positive about them only reinforces what the WBFF and what, you know, healthy competition is really, really all about. So what I want to know from you, though, is is uh when did you first fall in love with fitness good question um well let me take you one step back and this was when i was a teenager i can remember i can remember it clearly 13 14 and um i'm the only i have a younger sister so i don't have any older brothers around me so i guess at that age when you're kind of becoming a teenager and kind of finding your identity you're, you're almost searching for that that male identity, that figurehead hero, if you like, that aspirational figure. And I guess for me, it was my cousin on my mother's side of the family and her nephew. His name is James. He lives in England on the south coast, and he was very much into water sports, windsurfing. Right. He's now into wakeboarding and volleyball and football. Anyway, he was like the sports star of the family, the group. So. I was, I'm four years younger than him, and whenever we would get together, I would always be the one kind of lagging behind and trying to catch up with him. Anyway, I found my calling with mountain biking when I was 14, and it was that adrenaline rush. It was, it was um, it, every man for himself. You know, there was no team spirit or sport necessarily. There were races, but it was really each man was for himself. So that's what I really liked about the mountain biking. Anyway, I suffered an injury. I actually fractured my shoulder, my left clavicle, oh, when wow. I was 14. And uh, it was a pretty pretty nasty accident, but fortunately I wasn't too hurt. But I had my arm in a, a sling for a good five or six weeks. And of course, when you're 14 at school, um, braces, you have the odd acne. It's, it's not, the best, not the best time to have that. Right. So as soon as it was off, I remember 
our window cleaner, our family window cleaner, his name is Bob Campbell. He was a, well, he still is at that time, the world powerlifting champion. And he just had these great arms and just, he was a man. Had a big belly on him too, but now I understand why, because of the low center of gravity for weight training. But mm -hmm. anyway, I, I spoke to him about wanting to build up some strength. And he said, I'll take you along to my gym and I'll show you some exercises. And there's me stood with the Men's Health magazine saying, I want big biceps and a six pack. <laughs> and right there, he, said, he goes, I'll, I'll show you the way. I'll teach you how to train properly. Right. And I can remember, I'm, my mum took me down to this gym. And if you think back to the pumping iron days where this is an old scout's hut gym converted with no more than 15 pieces of rundown old school weight training equipment. And yes. I'm sitting there with my mum. My mum takes me into the gym and she looks at me and says, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And for once, I felt like this is my like, this is my playground now. It's mm -hmm. something that I can learn, something that I can really take on board and, and call my own. And the first exercise I did was, um, it was actually a calf, standing calf machine, but I did a shoulder press on it because I, I'd never seen them before. So within those following months, I had a lot of um, knowledgeable people around me who would teach me about full body training, split body, you know, isolation and compound movements. And by the time I was 17, I pretty much had a physique. Okay, I didn't have the muscle mass or anywhere near as much knowledge and understanding of the sport now. But I think around that time was when I just fell in love with having the control to take on my body and, and change it. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't change the way I looked. I could learn more. I could understand more. I was doing well at school. But the fitness was, that was something that, Here's something else. I always wanted to be ahead of myself. Right. Only, only now, this this year, pretty much, I feel I'm where I need to be in life, career. Just I don't want to be ahead of myself. But back then, that was I was in a gym full of you know strong, beefy guys. That sounds a bit funny. There were chicks around too, plenty of women. But it, it was something that I felt I could really look up to these guys and they could help me in, and age wasn't really a problem. I mean, I'm 15 in this weight training gym. Right. And um, it's funny, when I go back now, even before I started competing, when I'm sort of 20, 21, these same guys who would be helping me with an exercise would be turning around saying, Rob, what are you eating? How do you do your diet? Just because I was constantly learning. So when they would turn around to me and kind of ask me a question, I knew that this was something that I was I was passionate about, I was good at, I had a good understanding at it. I don't want to say I'm good at it. I feel I have a good understanding of nutrition, training, how to affect and get a result out of that, which is why kind of I've ended up in LA doing what I'm doing and really so grateful for it and trying to turn it around now and be that same figurehead for a lot of other younger guys especially, but anyone who's interested and, and the guys that were helping me and giving me advice, I want to be able to turn all of that around and say, here's the way I did it, here's what I didn't find work too well, here's something I'd recommend staying away from and, and all of that good stuff. So yeah, to, to answer your question in short, probably 14 when I broke my shoulder mountain biking. Okay, okay. Here's a two-part question for you, okay? Cool. Now, when you first broke into the industry, there wasn't any real like, you know, male model or fitness model, so on and so forth. So you you competed as a bodybuilder, correct? Yes, correct, yes. Okay. When did you make the switch from bodybuilding over to fitness modeling? Okay, good question. Well, I did my first bodybuilding show when I was 21 back in England. Okay. And these were um, various organizations um, they were all drug tested and it, and it was just the way that I got into it. And from 21 to 23, I must have done, I mean, I, I kind of, I won my first show, which kind of stunned me because it was a novice class. Mm -hmm. And I'm up against people who are, I had a 17 stone guy who's you know, way over 200 pounds and I'm on stage at 170 odd, but it was my conditioning that, my conditioning and stage presence that I think got me noticed. Okay. And then five, maybe seven shows later, I mean, I was busy in 2005 and six. I did every show I could to get my feet wet, to build up knowledge. And just because I really enjoyed getting out on stage, I remember 
going on holiday, a vacation to um, Spain, Ibiza, actually. And, you know, after the shows, especially in the, the early years when you haven't got much experience, you peak for a show and then you kind of let go. You go out and, especially at that age, I was drinking, I was eating pizza and ice cream, not every day, but, you know, on a night out. Yeah, man, but that's and good stuff, a, though. I, I think you need to go there. I've yeah. been there, I've done that, I've gone to kind of an extreme at both ends, and now I'm firmly in the middle where balance is everything, and I'm able to stretch it towards an extreme, let's say for this competition in six weeks, the world. Right. But then I also have that understanding to bring it back down, and I think that's really important when you're speaking with these new guys and people interested in stepping into the sport to make them aware of this, because no one told me. And after hitting that high of, especially when you win a show, and then the next day when you, that, that dedication, that time frame, everything that you've been building up to, it's like getting to the top of a mountain and then just falling straight back down. Right. So I'm, at, at the time, I hated at that, that place where I was, but now I'm grateful having been there that I have a bigger, I'm sort of aware of that bigger picture. But to go back to the story, I was on vacation for two weeks, I was training hard, I was with a fitness buddy, but we were in Spain, Ibiza. We were going out pretty much every night, having our drinks, eating pizza just as a blowout night. And I remember getting back, literally the next day when I got back into London, I was with a supplement company at the time who was doing some great things with me. And I went along to meet him and he said, there's a fitness show in a week's time at the Excel Center, which is kind of like the convention center in LA and, and the Performing Arts Center in um, Toronto. Mm -hmm. He said, there's a fitness show. We think you should do it. It would be great promotion and you don't have to pose. First time I've really heard about <clears throat> a fitness modeling show. Right. So I said, what, a week? Well, I've been out drinking and dieting. And they said, you don't need to be bodybuilder condition. You don't need to be you know, two, three percent body fat. You just need to look healthy like a sports model. Okay. So I thought, I'm up for a challenge, what the heck, I'll, I'll give it a go. Pretty much entered into, like you do, a final contest preparation week, you know, with that carb cycling. I think I just basically dropped my carbs. Again, going to an extreme, but at that time it was, this is what I know to do. Mm -hmm. Got up on stage, there's four people, four people on this stage, and it's not even set up properly. We're, I mean, we're talking about <laughs> boxers on a stage, and people are walking past. We had a guy in a microphone shouting out, the lighting was inadequate to say the best. Um, and we had this kind of uh, um, towel put up that we would walk through. I mean, it was a good show, but compared to compared to what I'm used to now and what I'm getting ready for, it is miles and miles apart. But there were four guys. I'd seen the guy who had won it before. He was in amazing shape. Right. And um, I actually beat him. I, this guy was in, in incredible shape. I came second. The guy who beat me was just a phenomena. He was, he's an older guy and he's actually been in some Madonna music videos. He's like the body. Kind mm. of got the Greg Pitt look, you know, right. that, that kind of body structure. So perfect for that. And what's funny is he's still doing that same show each year. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one else has won that show because he keeps going back, which is a, I don't know. You know, it, it's kind of unfair because no one else really gets a shot at that now. And there's plenty of other shows for him to move on and try and step up the rankings. But I think he just, you know, it's his it's his show. He goes and puts on a performance and he's the guy to be. So, you know, if that's what works for him. But that was in 2006. Right, right, right. Okay. And, um, hold, hold, hold on one second. One second there, Rob. You know, because I do got to cut to commercial. He's a great talker. Yeah, phenomenal you're a great job, talker. Right. Great you're a great job. talker. However, I do got to cut to commercial. When we come back, I'm going to let you finish up about, you know, the big fish in a little pond, which is the guy <laughs> that you're talking about. And, okay. You know, and then and then I want to get a little bit more in depth with you as to far as, you know, what keeps you motivated being that you've been in the sport for so long. So, Rob, you stay tight. Ladies and gentlemen, I got to cut to commercial, but stay tuned. You're listening to The Body Shop. TNS, where fitness comes to life. Need FTNS on the go? There's an app for that. Download the FTNS app for your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch now. FTNS, world's first fitness radio, will keep you moving. 
The fitness industry is beginning a transformation unlike ever before. It is more important than ever to be innovative and creative in order to connect with your customers. FTNS, world's first fitness radio, is here to help you do it. FTNS advertising packages are designed for high-impact, high-frequency reinforcement of your message. Over 70 million people in the U.S. listen to Internet radio each month. FTNS targets fitness-minded people that you want to reach but have never been able to effectively target before. Radio advertising is like word of mouth because it comes from a friend, the listener station. Internet radio is brand building. Positioning your brand through a concept or an attitude is easy to achieve personally, frequently, and economically on radio. Let's partner together to get your message delivered to the hearts and minds of the FTNS listeners. For more information, please email marketing at FTNS.co. Yes, 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 ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Body Shop. I am your host, Andre Brick St. Clair, with my in-studio co-host, Mr. Brian Canone. Andre. There it is right there. And on the line, I have Rob Riches. Now, before the break, Rob was talking to us about, you know, how we first got into fitness. And that was because he was uh, riding a mountain bike, fell, broke his shoulder, you know. And then uh, the way his body responded to the weight training, he, you know, loved it. Somebody took him under their wing, showed him a little bit. Rob entered his uh, first competition. I believe he was 21 years of age. Um, this was back in roughly about 2005. The show took place in London. Rob won. Then he then made the switch over to fitness. And for those of you that are just joining the body shop, the way he made the fitness transition was, you know, he was One week. Yeah, it was it was about a week. You know, but he was slightly out of shape and he wasn't in bodybuilding shape. Somebody said you really don't need to look like a bodybuilder with two to three percent body fat. You just got to come in and look more like an athlete. Rob did, jumped on, you know, won, beat the guy that's still competing now. Um, so this is where we're going to pick it up at. So, hey, Rob, you still there with me, right? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Now, you were talking about the gentleman that's still competing in the exact same show and he's winning it year after year after year do you feel as though he's doing that because it's a comfort level or do you feel as though he may be afraid of competition good question maybe a little bit of both i think he's he's not interested he has a business going on in in london he's you know doing a bit of acting, a bit of modeling, he's appearing in some pretty high profile music videos I mentioned he did the Madonna music video I think his interest level is just being a crowd pleaser right. I think he has done a bigger show and from what I can remember he came, he placed in the, like, the top three but also let me, let me make this aware he's, he's older, you know, he's in his 40s so you have a different look at that age and I think also a different mindset and also demographic that would be interested in you so right. whether he would be suitable for the kind of the magazine content and the profile that guys like myself and the other wbf athletes on stage are kind of hitting for i think for him it's just he has fun with it it's something to tweak his body because he looks like this most of the year round and for me we'll get onto this i don't walk around with three four percent body fat and that's that's for a number of different reasons, mainly because of the work I do and just, I enjoy going through stages and mm -hmm. going out and having a life with different groups of friends and having that focus to bring it right back and to bring it back even better than before. Right. But I think he just enjoys doing the show for the crowd, I okay. think, which is wonderful. That's really what got me interested in it with the, that, that crowd response. So it's, the stakes are so high this year. You know, they, they were tough in 2009, but that was my first time coming into the organization and hand on heart what a show everyone put on um it was incredible i mean yeah it was heightened because i i won it so <laughs> it, it was worth it for me to come in but you know i i put the work in i gave it everything i got and i came out number one on that day mm -hmm. and this show is a new show there's going to be a new day any, anything could happen so I'm putting everything in again 
I've got a little bit more to bring to the table this time. So, right. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who comes out on stage okay. yeah, and how they look. Now, Rob, you're one of the few. Um, I guess for right now, I'll just call you a model, okay? And okay. I don't mean that in any disrespectful no, sure. no, term at all. Okay, but you're one of the few model, fitness models out there with an actual eight pack. All right. <laughs> How do you maintain that? Like, walk us through your diet. Okay. Wow. Where do I start with this? Well, I think, first of all, from what I've looked into, because quite a few people have been asking me this, how do you get an eight pack? I think a lot of that is determined not necessarily by genetics, but by body structure. Okay. Depending on your torso length. Some people, if you look at some of the, the top ranking fitness models on the covers, I've already mentioned his name once, but again, I don't want to keep name checking people or not mentioning names, so I'll just keep that quite yep. kind of quite out, out of the, uh, the topics here. They have quite a long torso, and I think that allows their abdominal structure to be a little bit more stretched out. The linear alba, which is that kind of center crevice, appears to be a little bit deeper on some. I, at first, I thought, how do you train that? How do I get that deep kind of crevice down the middle? And for a long time, I couldn't get it out. And then for the final, especially for the last WBFF show I did, I found with diet and a few slight changes on my exercise, my abdominal routine, it's there. Everyone's got it there. Everyone has abdominal structure. It's just whether it's undeveloped or covered by a layer of body fat. Right. The whole eight pack thing, I found, um, for me, the magic thing was cutting gluten out and focusing first on lower abdominal exercises. So most people, you know, they, especially the ones who aren't competing, sit ups, crunches, machines, maybe the odd hanging leg raise, but really they're they're missing out on the main area that they're trying to develop. And so, again, research, asking questions, finding out what had worked for me in the past, looking at all of my previous records that I was documenting during contest prep, mm -hmm. lower abdominal, decline leg raises, hanging leg raises, all in that breathing technique and final hip flexion, and then moving on to my obliques, no weight, no side bends, a lot higher volume you know, for the abs, like with the calves because of their muscle structure. Um, I found that combined with dieting and heavy weight training to keep that muscle, that the muscle belly is nice and full and developed, I found I was able to keep pretty developed abs, but also bring that body fat level down so that you could see not just the abdominal muscles, but you could really see their structure. Right. You know, you could kind of get your fingers right in them. And when you're dieted, especially when you're water depleted on that show day, they really do pop. So. I've been lucky that I've had a couple of photo shoots where they've caught them, and uh, I will mention one name, Liana Sardi, um, who's now married, Liana Sardi Luzon, I believe, um, has probably caught some of my better pictures, and she's, uh, a, well, she's in Canada, Canada now, so um, I'm really looking forward to shooting with her again. But diet training, and it's, it's like a seesaw. You've got to find that balance. Again, bring it back to the middle, the balance, and not overdoing too much diet without focusing on the weight training. Right. And I remember in my early competition, somebody came up to me and they said, you're in great shape, but you're lacking the muscle. And I was, I was thinking of it as a conditioning show instead of a bodybuilding show. So in the past few years, I've really focused on maintaining weight training very much as part of my contest prep instead of just hitting the cardio and the diet. You know, if anything, my weight training ups during the final 12 weeks because it's countdown time and nothing is going to get in my way and every workout I need to better myself and six weeks out now things are starting to plateau out now so I'm starting to mix a few things up and change a few of my workout routines and lifting styles around but mm -hmm. again that's where some of that experience and that hunger for further knowledge allows me to think you know what this is a good time to do this or I'm going to save for doing that until the final week perhaps right Okay, now, when you're getting ready to cut down for a competition, do you prefer to use HIIT training or do you just do, like, normal cardio? In the past, I've done a lot of HIIT. And for one of my earlier bodybuilding shows where I still look at, back at the photos and think, how the heck did I get in that condition? There's, there's one picture on it's either my Facebook or it's, it's on one of the websites where I'm kind of doing a kneeling down back pose. 
Okay, I was 22, didn't have much muscle mass. I was hardly a bodybuilder, you know, from what people think of, but you can see complete um, hamstring separation. I had striations in my quads. Every part of that back musculature was showing. And I remember what I was doing for that. And it was 20 minutes of hit training on the bike. And at that time it was one minute on, one minute off, followed by a short 15 minute ab routine. And then on with my day. Um, now, I think because back then I was, I was working in a gym, I had a less responsibility that I do now. Mm -hmm. So I'm working longer hours now. Therefore, I'm perhaps not getting quite as much sleep as I know I should be. So I'm just, I'm doing steady pace now. It takes longer to do, but it also allows me to have a little bit of time on my iPhone and reply to some tweets and Facebook updates. And I'm not quite as tired. That hit drains you. And right. I actually did it the other day. And I found even though I'm eating the same foods, that all my foods now are weighed out by me. They're pre-cooked the night before and they're ready for me to eat at certain times in certain quantities. My body was so drained that I, w I could have easily ate double of each meal. So um, it, I think it's great for, for efficient fat loss early on, but I think at this stage, six weeks out, even eight or 10 weeks out, I've now found that switching over just to steady pace cardio at a low level is perhaps more efficient at burning body fat as opposed to spiking up my metabolism where already I'm kind of restricting the calories that are going in. So if somebody's looking at losing quite a bit of weight, I think a variation of HIIT training and more of the steady pace but longer duration cardio can really benefit them. For athletes, um, again, some people respond differently as with everything, but I found that for me, the steady pace allows me to maintain much more of my muscle fullness. But there'll be times where I jump on the bike or the rower or even Santa Monica stairs that I did a little video on and do some HIIT training just to mix, mix it up and to vary my workout because I enjoy training, so. Right, all right. Speaking of training, um, yes. you mentioned that you you actually kept a food or a training journal, and when you was you know trying to get the the lower part of your abs to come out, you went back and referred to everything that you did in that journal to find out what worked and what did not work. So, if you had to pick only three exercises to do, what would they be and why? Easy. First one would be for a decline leg raise okay. for the lower abdominals. And with this, it's, it's, it's really key on how you perform the exercise and how you breathe. It's one thing I could say, hey, do this exercise, and your followers and listeners could try doing it and think, oh, I kind of feel that, yeah, yeah, it might work for me. But unless they're doing everything right, it's not gonna be effective. So the reason I do that is with my legs pretty much cocked at a kind of an 80 degree angle to my body, my knees slightly bent, and on a decline holding to the handles behind me, I exhale fully as I raise my knees up towards my chest. It's a very limited range of motion. Okay. Knees come up towards my chest. Once all the air has been kind of puffed out of my lungs, I then really focus on my lower abs, putting my hips forward just a couple of inches off the bench. It's kind of like the reversal of doing a normal sit up or crunch, and your shoulders come forward. You're, you're closing that that arc between your hips and your shoulders. That's a great one for lower abs, I find. And I can really, especially when my body fat levels are low enough, it's like I can feel the lower abdominals and the internal obliques, that peak contraction. So that completely wins me. But when that happens, I take a short breather and just go back again. And I normally do them in a circuit. So that's the first exercise, the decline lower leg or knee raises, as I guess they are. Then I'll move on and focus on my obliques because of course the obliques are involved in assisting the lower abdominals. Mm -hmm. So I go and focus on kind of taxing them and, and getting towards a muscular failure with them. And a couple of different exercises, but I guess if I had to choose one, I love beach rest. So I sit, sit on the mat, cross my legs, keep them raised up, my heels off the ground so only my, my backside is touching lean back so I can feel a stretch in my abs, and then with a medicine ball or a 10 pound plate, rotate, keep my arms very fixed, swipe in the elbow, kind of like you're driving a car, but instead of steering the wheel from left to right, you're rotating the entire torso. Again, short breath, and I found that helps tighten up my waist. Right. Two side bends, I develop thicker obliques and some pretty good intercostals, but again, I think that's more to do with the structure of my upper body, 
as opposed to the exercises that I do. And then the final one is uh, another abdominal favorite of mine is the high cable crunch, okay. where you, know, you hold onto a rope or a bar, you're kneeling down, and it's all to do with the breathing. You exhale out, by the time all of the air is out of the lungs, I'm finishing off that crunch and really peaking the abdominal contraction. I mean, they, by now they're, they're starting to ache. I have to, I get muscle cramps in them. Uh, so a few seconds rest back on, anywhere from 30 to 50 controlled reps, and then I do another circuit. Wow. Circuits of those and that's done. Okay. But what's interesting, I'll just add in quickly, when I was doing the WBFF last, in 2009, for some reason I got into this numbers game where you just want to hit a certain number. And for me, it was a thousand. So I would burn X amount of calories doing you know, 30, 40, 50 minutes of steady pace cardio and then do so many circuits of abs, each one with 50 repetitions until I hit a thousand, um, which for the time I thought, yeah, this is really working for my abs. But then when I was short on time once and I thought I've only got 15 minutes, you know what? I might as well just hit abs pretty fast. I hit them hard but intense and I really felt them a lot more later that day and the next day. So from from there on in, I've just kept it kept it simple. You know, abs, you show them with low body fat levels and you develop them with short but high intensity exercises, keeping their duration quite, you know, the actual set of the exercise quite long without much weight. Okay. And I found that that's been the best result for me for my abs. That's good, that's good. Now, do you still feel that you can do fitness for a living and i do got to cut to commercial but i'm gonna I'm get that answer from you when we come back along with a few others so rob i need you to stay tuned ladies and gentlemen you listen to the body shop we'll be right back ftns where fitness comes to life <laughs> Rob Rich is on the line. You have so much information. <laughs> so much information that we want to get bits and pieces of it now. And Andre okay. said we set up some rapid fire questions for you to get awesome. your best advice for all the listeners. Okay. Okay. So he was uh, ending this conversation before where, you know, making fitness for a living, when I had wrote you about the show, I had thought you were a personal trainer and you said you're not a personal trainer anymore but you were at one time yes okay yeah, so I, mean, I still am now i still do personal training but my if you ask me what my op- occupation is mm-hmm. it's not personal training what is your occupation now what do you do well apart from being uh, wide and buried i have a video production studio in downtown los angeles that i, I run with um my business partner and a close friend of mine, his name is Dimitri. I met him as a client. He contacted me and we set up a training consultation and, and went to a session. I, he was very knowledgeable, but just wanted what I like to think of as like the extra 5%. Right. And um, 
my background, my, my degree is actually video production itself in London. So when he came along and he was studying at the Performing Arts Center, we got talking, his background was very similar to mine. And I, I kind of came out of nowhere, but within a month we'd got a pretty big studio in downtown. We started to amass all of this video production equipment. We, um, we're now a fully in-house media digital entertainment company and uh, I guess through the competitions and through my fitness involvement we've got a couple of contracts that keep us busy were you Thank doing you. that before this happened I mean you I saw you were always online and doing videos for a long time but was one of your sponsors involved in that or were you doing that for that company well back then this is a couple of years ago yeah one of the sponsors that I was involved with took a leap of faith, I guess, and went into the video channels and thought, you know what, there's not that much information on either online or certainly not on TV. Why don't we look at getting a, starting up a video channel? Right. So this was early back in 2008 and it's where I first met David, David mm -hmm. Kimberly. And it, we had an internet show, um, it was called, it was called the LA Muscle TV. Yep. And then later, got called the Rob Richards show. I think because more people, certainly in America, perhaps knew of me than they did of the, the UK brand. Were you the, like, were you hired as the announcer for that show? Was that your role or was it larger than that? It, here's how it went. I was, this turned from a sponsorship into a job. So I was given a pay yep. to set up everything. And from that, I would bring in other people to work with. Um, I had to, I didn't have to, but I chose to at that time to put together the location, the guest list, I mean, do everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've seen from my past ways that it's much better to work with good people, work with great people, and you'll make, you'll be much happier doing it, you'll make much more money, and I think the most important thing is you have longevity with it. So it, it was kind of my gig, yep. it, it was their content, but it was my putting together of everything but the internet TV started within six months they again went one step bigger and we had a channel on a big cable network throughout Europe and apparently my programs are still being shown on there so it's great to receive emails and, and contacts from people who are in Germany Italy saying they've watched the program and how they've become inspired to start taking fitness seriously I mean really that's competition aside which is for me it's a personal achievement and it does get my name and image out there which is a good thing with a lot of the content you're creating with your video production company does a lot of it pertain to fitness yes okay. uh, everything does actually and what's interesting is much of the work I do for these companies which is really my day-to-day -day job is not seen by you know the general the general public they're, yep. they're, a lot of them are overseas company they put them out in a particular way that perhaps my fitness following or this kind of dem our demographic isn't aware of them which I'm trying to now bring to more mass attention through what I'm doing but the YouTube videos and the stuff that I do personally is really just that takes place when we finish work or on a weekend and I basically throw the camera to Dimitri who I work out with also and say hey can you film this workout and mm. Whereas initially I might be going, check out my abs or look at my arm. I've kind of grown wise to the fact that, you know what, people follow me because they want to get something from me yep. instead of wanting to listen to how great I think I might be. Mm -hmm. Which was, I had an ego trip early on and, and thankfully somebody of um, quite high up in the industry took me to one side and kind of said, hey, kind of ease back, you, you have a great position here and you need to see what you have going for you. And when that person told me that, it was, you know, I name check this person because he's important to me. It was Clark Bartram. Okay, um, Clark, okay. Clark, who I know has been, has been a big help for a lot of, um, I guess, up and coming and current yep. fitness models alike. He kind of told me that. And when, when you hear those words coming from somebody like Clark, it, it rings a bell. So okay. now I do all the videos and try and put something out there and think, Rob, what would you, what, what type of advice would you give? I'm sure you see a lot of other YouTube videos that other people put out. Um, what would you say the best advice for somebody who's going to shoot a video? I mean, do you wear like a clip-on mic and, and do you take it to that kind of level? What do you think people should do? 
We do have we have a very good mic because yeah. half the time we use the um, professional mic that we use when when filming. But I think if they're going to get into a gym, one of the hardest things is getting clearance in a gym. And I don't want to say do it without clearance or yeah. do it with. That's their own prerogative. But if you can, lighting and sound are so important. If people can't see or hear what it is that you're demonstrating or talking about, there's no point. And if you put out just one bad video, that could potentially damage the speed at which you could grow and, and build a, a solid following that could really provide you with a lot more work from different companies and so on like it has with me. So check, make, make sure you have a decent camera. High definition camera, a, a cheap and uh, effective now yeah. and even if it's a clip on mic it, it's going to make it a lot better and then the information part yes people want to see that person train and especially if they're in good shape they want to they want to see the body parts move and they want to see the exercises that you do but what i found is i'm not doing it now but keep it short throw a tip here or there with an exercise just so that when they've watched it they think that was entertaining i have that motivation now to go down the gym and I'm now equipped with a little bit more information to step up my training to that next level. Right. Hey, now, now you've had some luck with some of these sponsors you've landed, and one of them I see is, is an underwear company. How did that come about? Yes. Um, <laughs> <it's quite funny. laughs> I'll keep this one short. A couple of years ago, three or four years ago, I had some body casts made by a well-known sculptor in England. He'd actually done some face masks for the like of uh, Bruce Willis. So he'd, he'd worked in the movie industry. He contacted me through a mutual friend and said, we would like to do a, a body sculpture of you for our range. I thought, that sounds pretty fun, sure. Had my chest and like abs and arm cast. And um, anyway, we ended up with, as kind of part of my payment, I guess, ended up with several, well, 30 of them shipped over to LA. And I'm looking at these things thinking, yeah, it's kind of cool, but <laughs> why, would anyone want to, why would anyone want this on their wall? Photos is one thing, but to hang a piece of me on their wall? So it, it turned out one day, because I'm always trying to think of new ways to not just put myself out there, but really, you know, everyone, everyone needs to hustle a little bit. So I thought, I live in LA, not too far from Hollywood. Let's take one of these sculptures around some of the stores in Hollywood and see if they might want to put them in their store and you can dress like a shirt or something on them. <laughs> anyway, I walked into this one underwear store um, and you know, bear in mind we're talking about West Hollywood so that kind of builds a bigger picture. Uh -huh. And as soon as I walk in, the, the, the owner goes, he goes, are you a model? And what's interesting, I don't, I don't think of myself as a model. I'm more, I'd rather see myself as that video guy or the guy who likes fitness and he kind of puts it out there. So I, I, one thing I've learned is to always say yes. If someone asks you something, are you an actor? Do you act? <laughs> <laughs> are you a model? I said, yeah, I've, I've done a little bit. It turned out he was doing a fashion show for underwear like the next week and wanted 15 guys in shape. And he's like, I'll pay you this much. Can you get 15 guys? Again, yes, I can. <laughs> Had no idea, but thanks to Facebook, I managed to get them in. Anyway, from, from, he, he never bought a sculpture there in mind, but that was the door in it. was the back that was like, yeah, something crazy. And then the next, the next week, he said, look, we're doing some photo shoots, and uh, I want to introduce, uh, introduce you to the owner of this brand. And it turned out they, they worked with me. They flew me out to Barcelona. We did a shoot. A lot of the shots were, you know, they were great. Part of my whole interest in coming to America was, yes, I want to get a magazine. Yes, I want to win a big competition. Yes, I want to be a underwear model. You know, that whole Kelvin Klein thing, it, right. it's appealing to, you know, kind of tick off and say you've done it. So I was I was lucky and fortunate and had a great time doing that. And, um, you know, it's something that I, I still do now and again, but I'm also aware of how people may view me now. And putting images out in underwear may not bode too well with the whole Hey, listen to me if you want some fitness advice. So I, I do want to put this out for all of the new new people coming into the industry and looking for new to get started. Think about the bigger picture because it's all too easy to get into a magazine or do some kind of photo shoots, work with a certain brand or product that might pay a little bit of money that would put money in your pocket. And sure, we all need some quick cash, but mm -hmm. think of the implications that this may have later down the line. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I don't think I've done anything a little bit too 
too risque and I know this might be different for girls listening because of the whole glamour side to that so I, I really pay attention to that if, if you can save on a little bit of publicity from a, a magazine or something or even bypass a couple of hundred dollars for doing that thinking that you know what I am going to get to this point where I want to be an established role model or published or competitor and this may not help my, my course for doing so it's, it's about thinking about the bigger picture and having that game plan that's really worked well for me Okay. Absolutely. Now, Rob, now we both know the reason that you did the male um, underwear thing was because you want to be like David Beckham. I mean, you know, he's from England. <laughs> you got the UK accent. Come on. Come on, man. Tell me the truth. Um, I mean, you know what? He's definitely a, like a, a, an icon. I okay. Mean, he started out, he started out, and I've been following him since uh, back in 2000, no, 1996, when he first got signed, I guess, with Manchester United. Right. Uh, and he was dating one of the Spice Girls. He's now married and has four children, I believe, with Victoria mm -hmm. um, Beckham. So he, he started out as very a, a passionate footballer. He wanted to be the best at what he was, what he enjoyed doing. And from doing that, I think he got recognition for, you know, he's definitely, he's a good looking guy. And he got picked up by a couple of um, products and got put out there in the media. And, and of course, when I come over to LA, there he is hanging from an Armani poster in his underwear. So, <laughs> yeah, if, if you can follow in the footsteps of someone you admire, I think it's it's kind of a sign that you're doing something right. So he's definitely an icon of mine. Um, whether I get photographed in a sarong, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's <worthwhile> for him. <laughs> okay, no. Rob. Okay, hold on. You ready for this now? Hey, Rob. Oh, hit me with it. Yep. Okay, here we go. Here we go. What's your favorite body part to train? Favorite body part, um, probably shoulders because I can see the most separation in them when I train. Okay, women, blonde or brunette? <laughs> um, I have to say mostly blonde, but my the past the last one was brunette and she was definitely the best. <laughs> <laughs> no name. Okay, <laughs> for you personally, all right, would you rather be a okay. bodybuilder or would you rather be a, a fitness model? fitness model okay why did you choose to compete with the WBFF <laughs> can I be honest absolutely I won every other show <laughs> you know what there's nothing wrong with that do you consider yourself more of an innovator or more of um, you know somebody just follows a trend I can answer that in two short questions <laughs> one when my friends start saying to me hey, did you see my Facebook page? Did you see what I posted? And most of the time I say no. And it's not because I'm so inverted and involved in my own life. It's just, I'm so busy putting everything out there on a website or a blog or editing my own video to put out into onto YouTube that I really don't sit on the computer that much mm -hmm. and kind of browse. So I don't know, call it stubborn or call it self-centered, call it whatever it may be, but I would like to think more of an innovator and in putting out new ideas and new styles and concepts for people to embrace and take on board. Okay, good. Do you consider yourself to be a role model? How can you answer that one? Um, I consider myself to put information out there and put out an, uh, an image, a brand if you like, for people to take on board and, and yes. In short, yeah. I was trying to work my way around that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, listen. <laughs> you got to give the Charles Barkley type answers. Either you are or you're not. You know what I mean? That's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. If you were not a fitness competitor, what other occupation would you be doing? I would love to be a TV host. And again, not for the, the whole glitz and the fame of it although that is appealing of course mm -hmm. it's the fact that it's the same thing when you go on stage all eyes on you it's everything that you've been working for it's go time and you you have an impact on people yes you enjoy it you get paid pretty well especially if you're in the higher rankings of tv hosting right um and it's just fun you go to work and kind of everyone's waiting for you and providing you do good work you know everyone Everyone has a great job and gets paid well because of the team spirit. So, and that's something I'm working for now. We we have a, 
couple of connections with some networks and because of the work that we're doing that's currently unseen by most people but I'm starting to put it out there now okay. me and my business partner are looking at getting into more studio airtime and, and working with some food networks so I'll leave it at that okay, okay. just a couple more sure is this still fun for you absolutely All yeah. right. maybe last year I eased back a little bit because a big part of that was when you when you achieve something so big like winning what is the biggest fitness competition let's be honest there's other male fitness competitions coming out there but again it call me biased or not it's it really is the best I mean look at the guys all of them have magazine covers and have promotions and sponsorships I mean it's it's incredible right. to come off something like that and then to try and get back into that mindset especially when you have done so well before. It wasn't that, I've got to clear this up right now. It wasn't that I was afraid of losing. It was more that the drive of wanting to go back and do it all over again wasn't quite the same. I now like I get to come back and with a new champion and with someone to beat and with someone to, in a way, try and, I keep saying this, try and take that title away from the person, Obi, who has won it. Mm -hmm. um, it's a goal for me now. You know, suddenly I'm not in the lead. Think of like a, 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 a horse race or a dog race. The leader suddenly gets overtaken. Maybe he had a bit of a, a rest to, let's say, put on some more size and come back even better. Right. Now there's a new leader in front that makes it all that more challenging to try and overtake that person. So it's definitely, uh, I, think, I think this year has been the most fun of it all because I've been able to bring everything to the table. Okay, now real quickly because I do got to sign off. If there is one thing that you would like your fans to know about you and you can sum it up in two sentences or less, what would it be? I'm just a normal guy. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I put it out there, they see videos and they might see some photos and locations, but honestly, if they, if they were to follow me day in, day out, I'm just like them. I have down days, I have ups and downs, I have problems and issues. It's just that I don't put all of that out there. Maybe I should to show that, look, what they're doing isn't as far off as what I'm doing. I just got lucky at certain places. I've probably been doing it a little bit longer, so I've had more time to sprout some of my seeds that I've been planting, but I'm not inhuman. I'm not, yeah, I'm no different from anyone else. It's not genetics. It's not necessarily I've been gifted or anything like that. Pretty much anyone can uh, crack the code or just work really hard at it. And when they get it, when it clicks and they finally understand it, amazing things can happen with their body and also in other areas of their life. I mean, it's a testament for me. Good, good. All right, Rob. I, uh, I, I came from England and I'm now in L.A. kind of living my dream. Right, right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm heading out to L.A. very shortly. I'm going to look you up. Me and you, we're going to jump into the Ferrari Testarossa, my treat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Of course, I'm renting it. But you know what? We're going to hang out. We're going to train together. But listen, Rob, I want to thank you. I want to wish you good luck. Um, at the Worlds, August 27th, 2011, in Toronto, Canada. Just real quick, it, it was a pleasure talking to you, Rob. I never talked to you before. It was, it was really interesting being able to talk to you like that. Because, it, like you said, uh, it's now... It's been my pleasure to be on. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So, in closing, ladies and gentlemen, success breeds envy. The best revenge you can have against a jealous person is to become even more successful. You keep God first and everything will be all right. I want to wish my good friend, Rob Riches, uh... You know, good luck this coming August 27th. And to everybody else out there, I got to go. But I'll see you when I see you.